Welcome to Coastal Front. Join us each week as we sit down with the movers and shakers of Vancouver to discuss stories of business, politics, accomplishment, and failure. Our aim is to keep you dialed into what matters most in our city. Now, here's your host, Andrew Johns. Great. Well, here we are with John Williams. So excited to have you here. John Williams, president of Live to Play Sports yep. and Norco Bikes. Yep. And we were just talking a minute ago about how I had a Norco bike when I was a kid, but I also bought a Norco bike last year Wonderful. for my wife. And uh, I haven't bought one a new bike for myself in a few years, but um, we have a young family of three young children growing up. And uh, they're, they're, How old they're, are they? Uh, they're seven, six, and three. Oh, they're just getting so, into cycling. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I'm sure there'll be many more Norco bikes coming through our family's uh, backyard and, and on the streets around us uh, soon. So... But let, let's just dive right into this. You you are the president of the both companies, um, and I actually have never heard of Live to Play. What is Live to Play? Well, that's a, a, you're not unusual on yeah. that front. Uh, Live to Play Sports is the corporate entity. Okay. And about seven years ago, uh, the company was previously known as Norco Products Ltd. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was a lot of confusion in the marketplace. Uh, Norco is that a bike brand? Is it a distribution company? Is it a corporate entity? Yeah. And so we really want to deliberate or free up Norco. And so when we talk about Norco, it's solely a bike brand. Gotcha. And so today when you say Norco, it's just Norco bikes. It's okay. not a distributor. It's not a corporate entity. It's just bikes. Gotcha. Uh, whereas LTP Sports is the holding company of cycling brands. Okay. And so LT, LTP Sports or LTP as we like to call it, uh, we distribute about 70 cycling brands, uh, third-party brands, and brands we own. Uh, oh, wow, really? So the brands 70. we own, about 70, yeah. uh, would be, obviously, we've heard of Norco, yeah. uh, Axiom okay. Gear, uh, 49 North product, uh, Bike Mate, there, Adams Trailer Bike. So there's a number of proprietary brands. Okay. And these proprietary brands were responsible for product development, for creating consumer pull, for marketing them. Yeah. Uh, and and we have we can obviously sell them in any market and any channel in the world. Okay. Third party brands, which is about sixty plus brands that we distribute in Canada, we only have rights to these brands in Canada. Yeah. Uh, and uh, some we have on an exclusive basis, some we have on a shared basis, and uh, we'll determine what channels to sell them in into okay. in Canada. And in the, of those sixty brands yeah. that you're a distributor for. Which ones are kind of well recognized? The average person no, might recognize uh, names. If you're an avid cyclist, Wahoo Trainers. Wahoo Trainers, okay. Uh, Yakima Racks. Oh, yeah, yeah. Shram. Shram. Rock Shock. Okay. Uh, 510 Shoes. Rock Shock. Wasn't that Rock Shock? A Can- was that a Canadian? No, piece? that's a, that's US. US, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, pretty I, much I, if. I have a Yakima trailer now. There you go. And if you bought it in the last five years ago, it was sourced through LTP. Gotcha. Okay. Right. So this all came about just in the last five years, this sort of re- yeah. reorganization. Okay. Now you've you've been with uh, LTP and Norco for how long? Uh, since 98. Since October 98. 98. Wow. Yep. And when did you become president? Uh, 08, 09. Okay. So it's been, you've had a solid uh, over a decade. About 10 plus years, now. yes. Okay. Good for yeah. you. Okay. Thank you. Um, well, I want to start off by saying that the way we got in touch was with uh, Sam. Uh, so big, I'm sure Sam is listening. So Sam, <laughs> thanks for... Hello, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks for... We won't say anything disparaging about you on the online. We've got lots of stories. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but Sam Sam and Nate, uh, they've obviously been big partners in this business. Yes. Let me talk a little bit about the history of, of Norco. We'll just... I know that we're talking about more than just Norco, but let's just stick that name because it's one name that recognizes. Fair enough. Uh, I mean, the company, originally uh, the name was uh, Northern Industries, Northern Cycling Industries, back in in 64 when the company was started uh, by these two founding families, the Zauco and the Lewises. Uh, uh, Bert Lewis, he managed the company or led the company from 64 right through to about 2000. And then he handed the reins on to a gentleman named Jim Harmon and Jim retired in 08, 09, and I took the reins there and yep. have been leading the company uh, ever since. So, you know, it's quite a success story from a, a shareholder perspective, uh, having the same two founding families in a yep. privately held company, uh, growing it from virtually zero uh, business in 64 to over $100 million today. Yeah, incredible. Uh, yeah, just just incredible success yeah. story from, from, from a shareholder perspective. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
And um, I know, I remember last year, Sam sent a, a note out to me, or we were talking, and he was really excited about, you guys had a little bit of a party for your 55th year, I think was last, was it last year? It's or? in March, this year. Oh, March of 2019, well, this year, right. March like, of this year, yeah, yeah. 55. Yeah, wow, incredible. <laughs> um, so the the bike market is a market that I got to imagine is goes through a lot of ups and downs. I mean, it's probably not the most stable industry. Is it a tough market to work, uh, run a business in? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Most people from outside the industry goes, you must have had phenomenal growth, right? Because they see all these new cyclists on there, particularly when it comes to, to mobility and commuter type, sure. type products. But uh, the industry data we have, and industry data is a little hard to come by. Like we have no industry data in Canada. Okay. So we have to rely on the data we get in the, in the uni- out of the United States. Yeah. And it's been about a $6 billion retail industry for about the last 20 years. It might fluctuate a little bit each year, it really but, grown that but it has not grown. Right. In fact, units are shrinking. Yeah. Average price points are going up. And is that because bikes are just lasting longer? Uh, or what, what's the reason for that? Well, because when, when you say units are shrinking, yep. does that mean less people are riding bicycles? Less people are riding bikes oh. today, and the industry uh, has thrived for a very long time on the white male baby boomer. Okay. And that market is shrinking. Okay. By 2020, by next year, uh, the millennials will be the largest single consumer group yeah. or demographic in North America, over 100 million people. Yeah. Um, millennials, they ride less. They ride less. They, they just ride less. Yeah. Now, what about, I mean, I see throughout Canada, but especially out here where we live in, in British Columbia and the West Coast, it seems like every municipality is building like crazy these infrastructure yep. for bike lanes. That, I'm assuming, is that good for you? But I guess they also have this bike sharing programs, which might not necessarily be good for the business. Well, bike sharing, uh, there's pros and cons. I think yeah. the, uh, some people will say the pro is you get more people excited about bikes. Yeah. And then maybe they'll go out and buy their own bike. Right. And so we look at it. It's never a bad thing to have more butts and saddles, <laughs> butts right? And saddles. Exactly. <laughs> right. That's not a bad thing, right? You can see that on your card. Yeah. John Williams, roll, uh, uh, you know, objective number one, butts and saddles. Get more butts and saddles, right? <laughs> so you, you got to view that as a good thing. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, the some of the unintended consequences, some of these bike share uh, programs hurt some of the rental accounts right. in the cities. Right. Right. So there, there's, you know, there's a yin and a yang. Yeah. Uh, and we don't sell bikes into the bike share uh, programs there. No. Uh, you know, they're kind of an industrial utilitarian type of bike. Yeah. Right? You're not getting performance. You're not getting things. performance no. out of those things. So yeah. it's for a, a short, you know, maybe some tourists will use them to go around town. Yeah. You might use it, you know, down to the local store or something like that. Uh, but it's, it's, is it good for the industry? Again, if you want to get more butts and saddles, it's good for the industry from that perspective. Yeah. Certainly the infrastructure, yeah. uh, all these bike lanes and that, that has certainly helped the industry, uh, particularly good, on right? mobility and, yeah. and obviously the, the, the commuter side of the business. Yeah. And have you, has, from a product side, I mean, going back to my, uh, my comment about I had a Norco bike yep. when I was a kid, it was a BMX. Kids don't ride BMXs anymore. Do they even make them anymore? No, no. BMX, it's probably not as popular as it once was. Yeah. You know, when we talk about cycli- uh, so, you know, cyclicality in the cycling yeah. industry, the BMX market does this. Okay. And yeah. right now it's on a bit of a lull. Yeah. Uh, consolidation happening uh, within the BMX market. Uh, but no, there's still, you, you go around, there's a lot of BMX parks uh, in the lower mainland or yeah. a number of them, and there's still racing going on. Yeah. And kids, you know, a lot of these BMX parks are skate parks as well. Yeah. And so, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's I don't know if it's healthy, yeah. but there's some business there. <laughs> yeah, sure. There's, I think, if I recall uh, the MPD dad, it's probably four or five percent or less than four or five percent of the total bicycle market is, is BMX. BMX. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, I, I, I remember riding through the uh, trails in the, the back country in Port Alberni yeah. where I grew up as a kid with my Norco BMX bike and man, uh, I can't believe I did it with no helmet, <laughs> like riding late at like when it's like pretty much the sun's going down in the summertime mm-hmm. with my buddies out there all day, just burning around, burning tons of calories, but also like <laughs> well prone to like major concussions and baking, breaking my back. I mean, I don't hope my kids never have to do that kind of silly stuff. I look back yeah. now, I'm like... <laughs> it's a different world. It is. It's a different world, yes. I'd love to ride... It, conception, I'd love to ride a BMX again, but at 45, I think I'd probably end up hurting myself, so I'm glad to stick to something more well, simple. W- while you speaking of BMX, uh, we're the distributor of Haro BMX bikes okay. in Canada. Haro and, uh, and Premium 
Uh, and, and, and I don't know that brand. I'm sorry. Okay. Is that a big? Is that, that a it was one? in in the '80s and '90s. Okay. Right. Uh, one challenge with some of the BMX brands is there's a legacy with them with the name. Yeah. And so people who grew up in in the, the Jim Haro era era would uh, would be very you know, have would have that emotive connection to the brand. Gotcha. But as they got older, they probably left. Yeah. Uh, the BMX riding. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Uh, now, speaking about markets, yeah. is, you're a Canadian-based, Vancouver-based yep. company. Well, your headquarters are actually, are you in Coquitlam? Or uh, you Port Coquitlam. Port yep. Coquitlam. Um, is the Canadian market a big part of your overall sales? It is the single largest market it for is. us. Okay. And so this is where we got to really st- uh, separate the business. Uh, third-party brands, we only sell them in Canada. Okay. Uh, but right. when we look at Norco bikes, we sell Norco bikes into about 25 countries. Yeah. Uh, Canada is the single largest market. Yeah. But we sell more bikes outside of Canada than we sell inside of Canada. Yeah. Okay, today. you do. Okay. Yeah. What's your next? So talking about Norco, because that's where I have an interest. Yeah. So what's the next two biggest markets for you after Canada for Norco? Uh, well, the United States. Yeah. Uh, then whether you consider the EU as one single market or a I series do. of yeah. separate markets. So EU, Australia is big. Yeah. Uh, again, uh, those those would be the the, the ne- next two largest yeah. markets. I don't know if you have the answer to this question, but reflecting back on the infrastructure being built with all these bike lanes, we're seeing it in many municipalities here in the Lower Mainland, Vancouver Island. But is that kind of that uh, build out happening in other markets where you guys are selling your bikes? Like, are you noticing that at all? Like, do you see with your date with your sales data, are you seeing? an increase in certain markets because you said globally there's it's been flatlined as far as number yep. of units in fact declining but are there certain markets like certain are there certain cities getting more bikes and less rural or? what you really see is is there's categories that are growing and categories that are shrinking okay and if you look to europe for example uh, cycling is is it's it's more ingrained in the culture yes a lot more people use the bike as part of the overall transportation infrastructure, yeah. and and they have separate cycle, you know, they have cycling lanes, and so yeah. uh, a higher percentage of people ride uh, commuter type bikes in the EU than they do in North America. Right. So th- that's a growth opportunity. Now, as as far as Norco is concerned, our identity is really around the the mountain bike space and touch point to dirt. So okay. while we have bikes in that commuter segment. That's not a a, mar, a a category we're actively targeting. Okay. Right. We are we are targeting the the sports side of the the, the business, uh, and really any product that has a touch point to do it. Really the MTB. Okay. MTB and uh, MTB mountain bike. Oh, mountain bike. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Well, and I guess really mountain bike was the next genesis after the BM. I mean, mountain bikes came out in what like the nineties somewhere yeah. around there. Yeah. And I think that's when most kids stopped having BMX bikes because you know mountain bikes could do so much more. Um, so I don't have a, a mountain bike. If I was out there looking for a mountain bike today, um, without getting super technical, what, what are the kind of things I want to think about in buying a mountain bike? I think the biggest changes you've seen over the last 20 years yeah. is advances in suspension okay, and kinematics, yeah. uh, frame design, frame material, braking, disc brakes are common on most mountain bikes now, okay. uh, drivetrain probably used to having a two by or a three by system yeah uh, often now they're one by so you're eliminating the front derailleur yeah uh that that would be a lot of the the technology change. different material yeah a lot more carbon these days and composite they're type getting materials really light, aren't they? getting lighter yeah uh there's always a trade-off between weight strength and cost yeah uh, as our engineers like to say, you can have two of the three, but not all three. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <fair laughs> so enough. if you want lightweight and, and strength, it's going to cost it's you. Gonna cost you a little yeah, bit, yeah, right? If yeah. you're okay with a bit heavy and strong, then you, you can get the price points less, down. Yeah. Well, you'd mentioned also about unit prices going up. And one of the other things that I've observed, and similar with the watch industry, you know, I have, I'm one of those old fashion guys. I got one bike, one watch. Yep. But it seems like all the young people I know, I've got lots of young people working on my team, and they all have multiple watches because they it's more of a fashion statement. I also notice a lot of my friends who are really bike enthusiasts, um, I, you know, I, I just don't have the time to have multiple bikes, but my friends that are bike enthusiasts will often have three, four bikes. Are you noticing that with your data as well, that it, it's not only are maybe the number of actual cyclists are dropping, the ones that are still into it, really into it, might have more than one bike? We have a saying, uh, the optimum number of bikes one should own is N plus one. 
N plus one. Yeah, okay. N being what your spouse will allow you to have. <laughs> Gosh, I like that. <laughs> and uh, you know, it's uh, you know what, what's it? Uh, it it's kind of like, uh, are you a skier? Yeah. Uh, no, I'm not. My wife. Okay, is, but, but someone yeah. who's a skier, right? Yeah. If it's a powder day, yeah, you're going to use your powder skis. But I surf. And if I it's, have multiple surfboards. There you go, right? Yeah. So you have you have different bikes for different styles of riding. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, you know, you're not going to, you know, obviously the extreme is a drop bar road bike and a mountain bike. But even yeah. within mountain bikes, so there's a multitude of categories. And, uh, you know, I can't tell you often, you know, I have a, someone call me up, a friend, uh, can you get me a bike? Yeah. I go, yeah, you got to decide what type of bike. Oh, I just want a bike. Yeah. Well, you got to know what your intended use is. Yeah, Once sure. you know what your intended use is, we can narrow down the, the selection. So on the mountain bike side, you can have, uh, you know, hardtail front suspension. Yeah. Uh, no suspension would be uncommon these days or full suspension. And then depending really the length of suspension de- really determines the gnarliness of the riding you're going to do. Yeah. So if you're riding in the Whistler Mountain Bike Park, you're going to need, uh, 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 you know, a big hit bike with, with long suspension yeah. to absorb the, uh, the the bumps. If you're riding just a, a flow trail, you could probably get by with a hardtail. Yeah, yeah, okay. And I think as I get older, uh, the, the gnarliness of my riding goes down, yeah. and I'm looking more for flow trails these days. What do you, what do you ride? I, again, I'm one of those people, N plus one. Yeah. <laughs> but but uh, my spouse isn't as concerned with the N part because I can obviously get bikes yeah. through uh, through LTP. But do you have a favorite? Uh, do, you, do you have a bike you've kept for a few years that you're like, man, this is my go-to? My uh, go-to? It really, again, depends on the styling. I, yeah. Like, like for example, my uh, my errand bike or commuter bike, now I'm on electric bike. Okay. It's just perfect for, you know, if I'm doing an errand, you probably within 10K, I'll take that out. If yeah. I'm doing a gravel ride, I'll ride my search. If I'm up in Whistler, I'll probably ride my old shore or range or maybe even Orm if I'm in the mountain bike park. Okay, okay. Uh, so it, it, if I'm doing the, the cross-country trails up in Whistler, uh, I will have an optic uh, or, or maybe, a, you know, maybe a sight. Yeah. It really depends. It, it absolutely gets down to the intended use of the bike. Now, did you get into, the, into working here because you were into bikes yourself? No, it was, I can't say I was necessarily. <laughs> I mean, I love sports. Yeah. I love all sports. Yeah. Uh, uh, but it's kind of funny. I'm an accountant by trade, by training. Oh, okay. I was I trained yeah. through EY. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, I was in industry working at a precious metal refinery. And um, I used to have you know, magazines back then. I guess we still have magazines now, but yeah. I had Trade Magazine. And in the back was a posting for a controller at Norco. So oh, really? I just applied. That's how you found it. That's how I found it. <laughs> it was I just happened to read that that monthly issue, and they were looking for a controller. So I said, I'll put my hat in the ring. And I know and, four months later, and, I was hired. And 20 years later. And 20 still... years later, I'm talking to you. Yes. Yeah, great. And you started when you were 15. <laughs> no, I wish. No, I am a, a bit older than that. In fact, I mean, I'm not shy about my age. Uh, how I know the, uh, the age of the company, because I was born in 64 as well. So, oh. Oh, there you go. so you it's, know, it's a, it's you a perfect match. It. I cannot yeah. miss that one. Yes. <laughs> oh, that's great. That's neat. Yeah. Let's talk about, uh, take a minute to talk about um, the world of competitive uh, mountain biking. Yep. Uh, I have a, a old friend of mine, a high school uh, mate that uh, was a wor- world-class uh, downhiller, uh, Roland Green, I think he was sponsored by Trek uh, for like two years in a row. He means not competing anymore, but um, that's a, that's a gotta be, I'm assuming a, big part of uh, developing your brand in, in the industry? Yep, yep, absolutely. I mean, athletes, they, uh, they there's several purposes. You have athletes that are on the competition side, yeah. so you race to win. Yeah, right. Sure. You're, you're not going to line up on the starting gate, you know, not wanting to win. So we want yeah. all our athletes to be successful, yeah. and we got to create the, the ideal environment for them to be successful. A lot of what we do is, is on the product side. Yeah. Uh, we sponsor a number of teams. Okay. We have a, a cross-country team and a DH team, and then along with other kind of privateer riders. Yeah. Uh, on our cross-country team, we're actually quite excited about them. They're all Canadian riders, and about three years ago, we said, let's pick some of the up-and-coming hey? on, on the cross-country side, yeah. and our goal is to get them to the Tokyo Olympics next year. Oh, wow. And Do, uh, are, can we pull them up? Is, is there a website that yeah. we will find their names? You'll or, get their names uh, right on our website, yeah. Yeah, it'd be really cool if there's an image or something yeah. you could get yeah. these, uh, yeah. these. So men and women. Men and women. Okay. Uh, and uh, the is Olympic ma- team. I didn't even know mountain biking is becoming an Olympic sport. Yeah, it's been an Olympic sport for a while now. Oh. I don't know exactly how long. Okay. Uh, 
apologize for my ignorance on the <laughs> fair on, enough on but our, our goal is to help them yeah get to the olympics in 2010 or sorry in 2020 as part of the uh of the canadian uh olympic team wow uh, the team hasn't been named yet but uh, we're very hopeful that they're going to make it. So you'll see we'll have Haley Smith there, Peter oh, yeah, DeSera, okay, yeah. and Quentin DeSera. Yeah. Uh, and, and they're having a lot of success on the, on the World Cup circuit today. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we also have a DH team, okay. which DH is, is for those a downhill. Who, okay, downhill. And yeah. that's often what you will see. That's the, doing the big jumps, uh, the, some, some of the gnarlier tracks uh, around the world. Uh, we have two Canadians on that team and a Kiwi, Sam uh, Blankenstop, and then Henry Fitzgerald, a, a local kid out of Whistler, yeah. actually out of North Van. And then a, a really neat here, story yeah. in the Elliot Jamison, his father wow, works for us, and okay. he's, he's riding the, in, you know, the junior uh, really? circuit right now. And he's having, he just finished fourth last weekend uh, over in Europe. Wow, good yeah, for him. So, uh, you know, and these are the guys that you see them all the gear. And that is correct. Full face helmet. helmet. Oh yeah, and they're just they're, they're just ripping it. They're just they going are down. unbelievable riders. Oh my god, unbelievable riders. I see some of those videos that they have. Where they'll put a, like a GoPro on. Yeah, top, and oh, yeah. just absolutely uh, oh, wild. Yeah. It's it's scary what they do. Yeah, it is. Yeah, they, yeah. you know these. Well, these are world class athletes. Yeah, sure they are. Right, yeah. they are world class yeah. athletes. You know, they so spend cool. all their time training and getting ready for races. Yeah, and so so obviously you want your your athletes to be successful when it comes to race day. Yeah. Right. You also want them to be good ambassadors for the sport. Yeah. Uh, good advocates for the sport, and then they also help in product development. Oh, I bet. Uh, I and mean, so, they're gonna, I mean, they're they're pushing the, the limits they're pushing on the envelope, yeah. right? And, and we're designing on. bikes. We want to give them product that they can yeah. win on, on on a global basis. So you've got people that work at Norco who I'm assuming then specialize in communicating between the uh, building group, the coop group that actually builds these. The, yeah, our engineers the, who design engineers. them and our product managers. Yep. Yeah, okay. Well, they have a direct line to, to a, these athletes. Right. And so this weekend, for example, I mean, it's what, August 14th today, yeah. right? Uh, is Crankworks up in Whistler. Okay. And so our athletes over there are competing now. Yeah. And then the Crankworks is another series. And yeah. it kind of neat. Last year, uh, we had Jill Kittner, who is, is, I think she's won now, 22 U.S. national titles, oh, uh, Olympic wow. bronze medal. Oh, yeah, she's just a world-class athlete. Yeah, uh, she's been the queen of crank, uh, crankworks now for I think the last five years. Wow. Uh, and then uh, Sam, he won it last year, the king of crankworks. Yeah. And then we also had the junior, uh, the prince of crank, crankworks yeah. uh, last year. So really? which is which is pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. Wow, that's awesome. Well, that's really cool. So now, the as far as like the best trails in the world. The, do this down right here in our backyard is it yeah, some of the short. best one yeah this is our identity yeah yeah right this is where we this is the most perfect p- training grounds or exactly yeah. what we say it's the yeah. most punishing t- training grounds and testing grounds yeah uh for the bikes so when these races are happening do you actually have especially if they're local i imagine it's pretty easy to just to send a norco engineer up and be do they ever like no they'll often travel with them around the world and we really? so well yeah, we'll supply mechanics oh yeah they yeah. they'll be there on race day and real uh leading up to race day so it's just like you mentioned that uh, analogy of like f1 racing it's like it's not just the rider they're not showing up at the airport with their own bike by themselves <laughs> yeah. and just kinda like, it's a whole support team kid. behind them yes <laughs> yes wow that's pretty cool oh yeah yeah uh, outside of the uh, North Shore mountains, where where else in the world are kind of like world class? I mean, if I was a if I was listening to this podcast right now, and I'm a pretty avid, yeah. you know, relatively advanced cyclist, and I want to make a trip somewhere to do something special, where would you send people outside of uh, the North Shore? I love Switzerland personally. Yeah, the Any Swiss Alps areas. The Lenzenheiden is nice. Davos is nice. Uh, Austria, there's some great riding down in New Zealand. Yeah, there there. Essentially, whenever there's a, a mountain range, yeah, there's going to be some good riding. Yeah, right. And so yeah, you wouldn't send them to uh, to Saskatchewan. Well, on Saskatchewan, <laughs> well, it's funny you say that. That's yeah. where the cross country bikes. You're not going to need oh, yeah. as big a suspension, right? right so right. you know, those it, are more uh, distance related. Right? Probably like, more distance yeah. uh, related. Yeah. Uh, it's. Uh, uh, you know, you can mountain bike anywhere, anywhere yeah. where there's trails. Yeah. Again, it goes back to the intended use. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so sure. if you were calling me from Saskatoon, asking me for what bike I should buy, yeah, I'd probably put you on a revolver. Right. Over and over. Okay. Can we just, out of interest, let's pull those up in the website sure. just so we get an idea of these names because you're you obviously know these like the yep. back of your hand, but a revolver versus an or. And while, we, while Ross is, is pulling it up, do you do road bikes as well? Yep. Yeah. We, uh, uh, again, we do drop bar. You'll see we'll do drop bar dirt. And so what's what's an emerging category is what are called gravel grinders. The gravel. the gravel, uh, well, the gravel category, yeah. uh, adventure category. And yeah. so we, we kind of like to say when the road ends, 
you keep on riding. Yeah. Right. So you can ride on 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 dikes or or gravel trails. Yeah. Uh, uh, not just limited to pavement. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Oh. So you had you had it there, Ross. So that uh, so this is the revolver versus that, a. And that's the cross country. That's so that's it. a full suspension. Yeah. So that top one is the like top of the line. And that's top that of you, the line. You're getting everything. You're that's, getting. That's where you get performance or strength and like and, and, and <laughs> you're getting and, you're getting two of the three. Two you're not three. getting the low cost. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But that's so cool to look at bikes like that. Like it's just so neat. What was the other one? The revolver and the uh, oar. Yeah, go to the mountain category there. And you see downhill at the top. So that's our downhill racing. And so that would be the Orem bike up there. Yeah. Oh, beautiful looking bikes. Oh, yeah. And and the engineering behind those bikes is unbelievable. Yeah. These days. Like if you ask me, you know, what's changed in the last 20 years? Yeah. Well, if you pulled up a bike from 2000 and today, yeah. it'd be like comparing, I don't know, a canoe and a spaceship. Yeah, right it's 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 unbelievable and yeah. you know today we have a team of engineers yeah uh that all they do is design bikes wow crazy yeah, yeah. talking about with the frame what is it what is a so on a bike like this like a, like a ten thousand dollar downhill top shelf bike um i'm assuming big part of this you're paying for is like the core of it which is the frame right? the carbon yep yeah. yep well, and the suspension, the suspension, brakes, everything, yeah. it's all, uh, all the drivetrain, uh, you're putting top of the line componentry on that bike. Yeah. When you look at the frame, though, look, it's made of carbon. Yep. So is where are these manufactured? In like, Asia. In Asia? And how, how do they, like, can you kind of on a more uh, granular level explain, like, how does that happen? They have like, some kind of, like, it goes into a factory and there's some some kind of mold or something like no, that? No, there's what's called uh, mandrels. And so y you will, uh, first you'll design the bike. it's not like pouring steel, right? No, 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 no. Uh, a carbon is, is a fabric. Okay. And it's a pattern. And oh. then you, and then there's resin to glue it together. Okay. To, to, to bond it together. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, really, I'd need our engineers here to explain it properly. I'm not going to yeah. give it justice. Uh, but so you, you'll, you'll see, you'll get a sheet of carbon printed out okay. and it's, it's all the patterns are there and then you will, you'll unpeel them yeah. and place them together in, in a predetermined manner over yeah. these mandrels to form the frame. What, what's a mandrel? It's, it is like, like a, a like almost a like a, a, like an, a plastic insert okay. that you're wrapping the fabric around. Oh, gotcha. And then, and then you will put it in an oven yeah. and, and bake it. Yeah. And then you'll remove the mandrels oh. from the frame. Okay. Because you don't need that you don't uh, need, yeah, during, during the forming stage. Yeah. Yeah. And you don't want that extra weight or whatever. And Correct. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Wow. That's right. So how long would it take in the factory? How long does it take to um, complete the formation of one of these frames? It, it really depends. Because it does have time. It, you said it has to cool? Yep. Well, it has yeah. to bake. You have to cool it. Yeah. Uh, they got to paint it. Yeah. Got to sand it. Well, you sand it before you paint it. Yeah. Deckle it up. Uh, it's. Uh, it, Is it like a car, like the high end cars, where if you really wanted to, you could actually ask for a custom build? Like. Uh, we are getting. If you, again, you look on our site, we have uh, build your ride, ride your build. And oh. so again, back to millennials. Yeah. Customization yeah, sure. uh, is 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 a growing part of our our marketplace. And so here it's it's for us. You, you have different uh, f colored frames and decal package okay. for your bike, but they're predetermined for us. So yeah, sure. Uh, but but, but then you the, can really select the components you want. So oh, first you'll go so through cool. and you'll select your frame. Uh, you so know what to, color you just want. Just again for the listeners, if yeah. you're if you're listening to this or you're. In, you want to go to Norco's site, and I'm just going to be a plug yep. for you right now here. Thank you, John. So you go to the site, and then you select on the site. Where'd you go there, Ross? Uh, it's right on the homepage. Uh, okay. Yeah. And it just it's where, but where? And then it says customize your bike. Uh, oh, I see. Okay. Or, yeah. Uh, start building. Yeah. Start building. Oh. And this is just like when you're looking at cars and whatnot. You just click on there and you select your. Wow, look at this. Select your frame, and then you select your suspension depending what yeah. price point you want to hit. Yeah. And you might be partial to a certain suspension kit. Right. And then you you uh, select your component package. So that's your drivetrain, yeah. brakes, uh, all the stuff. and then you, there you go. And then you scroll down. You need my credit card, Ross? I'm gonna <laughs> yeah, hit done. <laughs> 
Wow, and so that bill that. there that's is so is fifty two hundred dollars. And yeah. then what will happen is you will if you, if you carry on it, you'll select a dealer. Okay. And that and that kit will be then sent to the to the you know your local Norco dealer. Yeah. They will put it together for you, and then oh. you'll come up because then they will have to set it up for you. Yeah, of course. Yeah. You know, based on your weight, your height. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, you might have some personal preference how you want your yeah. your suspension to feel. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Oh, well, that's really neat. Um. Well, this is great. This is really. I want to now jump into. Uh, electric bikes. Fair enough. I see them all over the place. Yes. Um, I've been on the fence about buying one myself. I'm kind of like, you know what? Am I just going to put on weight by having an electric bike? <laughs> I feel like I should, you know, at least stick to a really good bike, but make it manual. So I still got to work hard for it. Right. Uh, but they're obviously becoming, especially in the commuter space, huge. Yep. Um, talk about the electric bike market. Well, I th- I think uh, one thing we have to do as an industry well, is is, up a little bit there, is so, just yeah. educate people a little bit more. And so you know your comment about uh, it's it, you know I don't have to work as hard. Yeah. You will determine how hard you work. Okay. On an electric bike, uh, all our electric bikes are what are called pedal assist. Pedal assist. So okay. which means there's no throttle. It's not like a motorbike where you just sit back. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, hammer on the throttle, and away you go. Right. What you get is as you pedal, dep- depending on your uh, on your power level, whatever you set yeah. it at, you get additional thrust. Okay. Through the drivetrain. Okay. Right. And so, what it allows you to do is go. You, you can either go a little bit faster, particularly yeah. on climbs, or you can go further distances. Yeah. And so, if you have two hours to kill, right, or you want to go for a two-hour ride, right now, let's say you could do two laps. Yeah. If you just had a normal traditional pedal bike. Yeah. If you want to do the this the same harder. trail. This, you know, most of the biking I've ever done is really more <laughs> on like on the road. But this okay. is what we're talking about here right now is when we're downhill, right? Well, or let's say I'm just talking a about a, a trail bike. But it, okay. it's a, well, the story is applicable to a road yeah. bike as well. So let's say you want to go for a road ride. Yeah. And you have two hours to, uh, to ride. So yeah. if you average, I don't know, 30K per hour, you can yeah, do a 60K strong. loop. Yeah. Right? Well, if you have an e-bike yeah. Yeah, and you have two hours to ride. You may be able to do just a longer loop, okay, or so that. You're still working the so same. you're still you. Well, uh, I'm not going to say you're working exactly the same because yeah. yes, I don't believe you burn as much energy on an yeah. e-bike as you do on a regular bike. Yeah. But it's not like you're burning zero calories. Right. I mean that that's yeah. the other thing. That's that's a little misleading. Yeah. Uh, so if if it helps you get out more, yeah. Sure. So maybe instead of going out two days a week now, yeah. you go out four days a week. That's a really Is that good a good point. thing? Yeah. Right. So maybe uh, you'll ride a little bit more. You might ride a bit further. Yeah. Uh, and you might enjoy it a bit more. And I have heard that. It, yeah, that makes that all makes sense. And I and I have heard from my friends who are mountain biking enthusiasts. Yes. Um, one fellow in particular who hasn't made that jump yet. He's just trying to make the decision of, um, you know, the cost he wants to get. Because we were talking about earlier. But what I heard is the nice thing about mountain bike, like the downhillers, is they just get more runs in. That's exactly what you do. Right, because yeah. they, they can get back up the mountain quickly. Because I understand how you do, you do run down the, the trails, but then you typically take more of a. Then you got to uh, climb back up. Yeah, climb yeah. back up. Usually yeah. it's a different route different on the way route. up, but yeah. you you know you got to grind it out. Yeah. And you know some people enjoy the climb. Yeah. Other people just want to put their head down and grind it out, and you know they're having more fun on the way down. Yeah. Uh, so. I, I now, can't. do they keep that uh, the the battery pack in the middle? Or do they put it in a backpack, or when they're going down, or what do you? What do no, you guys well, do? again, every bike is different. If yeah. you look at our bikes, again, if you look at our site VLT, yeah. it's fully integrated into the frame. It, oh, it is. So you oh, see on the Norco okay. down so tube there, a, yeah, the, that that's where the uh, the battery is. Let's take a look, Ross, at uh, Norco's top of the line. You're on it right there. This is it here. That's the site. So what's this called? The site VLT. Site VLT. Oh, that's the name of the bike. Is yep. site. Site VLT. Well, and we also have site and just a pedal only version. Uh, oh, gotcha. Okay. So we have an electric version and a pedal only version. Yeah. Okay. And so, what does this bike retail for, roughly? Oh, they're they're quite expensive. Yeah. You're you're getting north again, depending on your build kit. Yeah. Right. We have uh, three build kits, and I think they go from about sixty five hundred to about eighty five hundred. Yeah. Yeah, they're okay. not they're they're not cheap. Yeah. That's yeah. that's the bottom line. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, people that are buying this kind of bike are making an investment, and in they're. They're obviously, I mean, you could assume that they're they're not planning on just uh, going around the seawall. <laughs> well, uh, our our primary consumer for us yeah. is 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 that mountain bike enthusiast. Yeah. And so someone who's passionate about whatever, yeah. right? If you're passionate about photography, yeah. y- you're going to have good equipment. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah, so yeah. if you're passionate about the sport of cycling and you're an avid mountain bike biker, uh, you believe better equipment 
is going to enhance your enjoyment of cycling. Yeah. And really, at the end of the day, we're in the business of fun. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Uh, creating memorable experiences. And so, uh, you know, equipment is a big part of that. Yeah. If, 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 if you're not an avid mountain biker, then yeah, maybe you're not going to spend. Yeah. Well, not maybe. You're probably not going to spend that much money on a yeah. bike, right? Yeah. So it's, it's, it's people who are passionate about the sport of mountain biking and cycling are willing to invest in their equipment. Yeah, absolutely. And, that, and that's, that's the consumer we're going after. You know, you mentioned that uh, earlier that you didn't get into the business because you were into cycling, yeah. but you've clearly gotten into it. Um, yeah, as a little a, bit more, yeah, yes. <laughs> yeah. And I admit myself, like um, having kids um, has got me back into biking. Yeah. Because I'm looking at my three little ones, and uh, my little guy now is on training wheels. He's gotten off the, uh, uh, like the the tricycle, and he's on a bike with, and the the liberty that it seems to give them, the freedom it seems to give them, that they get so excited yes. about it. They just they they will almost never say no to going out for a bike ride. And we're on a big steep hill, so we have to unfortunately drive to our, our but it doesn't very far. We'll go to UBC, like. And they love it. They love it. And I go now with them too. Yeah. It's so fun. Well, the endowment trails are great out there. Yeah. yeah. It's it's perfect for riding. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, it's funny you say that, you know, I think when we were younger, uh, a lot of the kids' bikes weren't that good when right. you really think about it, right? Yeah. And and the difference between, uh, you know, our kids' bikes are premium or performance bikes yeah and so we're really concerned about the weight and about the performance of the bike whereas yeah. if you go to let's say the mass channel and uh, and and you buy a, a very inexpensive kids bike yeah brakes may you know brakes may not be set up properly it's yeah. probably made out of steel it's a bit heavier yeah and and you'll see kids it, it kind of upsets them at the sport of cycling yeah because you know they're logging around this big heavy bike that's not tuned up properly yeah yeah. Right, so we're turning them off the sport of cycling, and yeah. so, uh, you know, when we redid our kids lineup a number of years ago, we just kind of looked at the behavior of parents when it comes to other sports. Yeah, you know, in in Canada, obviously, a lot of people play hockey. Yeah, right. You see parents spending three hundred dollars on a graphite stick for their child. You know, six hundred dollar yeah. pair of skates. Uh, when when their kid is into the sport and the yeah. parents into the sport, they're willing to invest in the yeah. sport. Uh, Soccer is no different. Yeah. Like three hundred dollar pair of cleats. For your child to play soccer. Right. Crazy. Yeah. You know, when I was young, <laughs> I can tell you, I never had $300 Whoa. pair of cleats, right? Uh, and that's really the customer we're going after, yeah, right? Sure. Where they believe equipment can can really enhance your overall enjoyment yeah. and, uh, of the and sport. Look, it's true. I mean, it's just the reality. I mean, you know, you're building a premium product yeah. and they got a premium brand and not everybody yeah. can afford it. So these are the kids' bikes. So here are right? some kids' bikes, right? Like, so how, like, so my, my oldest is seven. Yep. And I, I, I uh, admit I bought these really cheap, mm -hmm. heavy bikes because they're so little, right? I don't even know because they're still on these tiny little bicycles yep. that you just get from wherever Canadian Tire. But to move to this, what, how old do they need to be before they get in a bike? Oh, well, it, it'll, well, again, it's all dependent on wheel size. So we have, and it's, it's, it's more about size. Okay. Uh, how they're hiding. We have a sizing chart there. Oh, you do? And so we'd okay. have, you know, we'd have bikes starting for like our run bike uh, for a child who's three. Oh, you guys sell those? Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Oh, the run bikes, yeah, with no pedals. With no pedals, I, right. Okay. Uh, well, sometimes they're called balance bikes, uh, yeah. run bikes. Yeah. Uh, wow, those are so, that's so neat. Yeah. So who are some of your, um, it, to, again, to kind of help plug your business and know where to buy <laughs> these in Vancouver, because I'm from Vancouver. Where, yeah. where would I, where do you want to go? If you're in the lower mainland, where are some of your better, um, the, some of the re retailers you really, you really like working with? Well, we could just touch go back just slightly there on on our part of our strategies we only sell our bikes through the specialty bike dealer network or the yeah. independent bicycle dealer yeah, network yeah. we won't sell into mass yeah so you won't find our bikes in canadian tire or yeah. walmart, walmart or yeah. costco yeah uh so you have to go to to a specialty bicycle dealer or an independent bicycle dealer uh, we have our own corporate store in the Lower Mainland uh, over in North Shore. Oh, do you? Uh, Nor it used to be John Henry Bikes. It's now okay. called Norco Bikes oh. uh, North Shore. Uh, if you're on, on the west side here, so where Comar. Is that in North Shore? Where it's is it? right is it on Brookbank. Uh, okay. It's right by NBC, okay. right across the street from NBC oh, great. Uh, in North Van there. We're with Comar uh, locally, JV Bikes, just down the, the block oh, here. Oh, Comar so, does it? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, now, today, we've just launched our direct-to-consumer initiative okay so if you wanted an oracle bike you can go on our website select the bike yeah and then select the dealer 
you wish to pick that bike up at. Oh, gotcha. So which could be, you know, it could be the, the bicycle dealership down the street from you. Yeah. Or it could be one if you're on your way to, I don't know, Whistler, and you stop off, you want to stop off in Squamish at Republic Bikes there, uh, you could pick it up there. Oh, wow. And so it, it re- it's, it's it's you know it's it's I won't say it's a new way of shopping but yeah. it's it's really that whole seamless integration yeah, of sure. the of really the the in-store experience and the online experience yeah so we uh, we have to blend those two worlds together yeah it makes a lot of sense I mm-hmm. mean it's you know it's all about making it convenient for the right. customer and uh, having a positive yeah. buying experience like know. in Canada I think we have about 270 dealers yeah. uh, across Canada and yeah. so in every local community we we would have a Norco bike dealer yeah. for you okay uh, and again, I know you're not on the uh, engineering team. Yep. But let's talk a little about road bikes because you do do road bikes as well. Yep. Okay. Can we just pull those up, Ross? Because that's more my kind of okay. world. But I'm not like on a race mm-hmm. team or anything like that. Just uh, um, and wait, by the way, what's the difference between a hybrid and an e-bike? Is there a difference? Uh, a hybrid bike is uh, pretty much a cross. Uh, it's it's you know part pavement, part off road. Yeah. An e-bike is, uh, is it has a motor in it. Okay. It's an electric bike. Okay. So and they could be kind of both. Well, you, know you know see, well you see there on our if you click on our hybrids, yeah, you'll you'll see the models we have, like. I think it's the the XF XFR, the uh, so I think the, C, I, I the I VFR. Thinking, I, th- I think I was thinking in terms of vehicles. Yeah. Right? Okay. Yeah. But that, <laughs> no, it's there's not. There's no gas in these things. <laughs> no, no, there's no gas in these <laughs> yeah, things. Yeah. It's just okay, so a, a hybrid is kind of get you between, you know, a road bike and like a mountain yeah, bike. Yeah, so, you know, those are looking more like city bikes there as well. Yeah. Right, yeah. more pavement bikes. Yeah. Are those ones when I when I see what's there. Yeah. Uh, the VFR series. Uh, I don't, can you just scroll down? Are XFRs in there? No. So th- yeah. those would all be uh, city bikes. Okay. Now, do you guys have a road bike team? No, not anymore because as as we focus to uh, products that really touch dirt, yeah, uh, we've moved away from uh, road bike racing. Okay, uh, so you still have a, a selection of of good road bikes. Well, a- again, yes, more in the the adventure space. Okay, again, if you go on there, uh, r- if you go all road, the the all first road. one there. Yeah. You will see there, it would be our, our section, which is a new road bike we put out this year. It's more of an endurance road. Okay. Uh, that, you know, if you're doing a Grand Fondo. Yeah. Uh, again, you wouldn't race on that bike, and you could race on it, yeah. but it's not a racing bike. Yeah. Uh, and then as but it's you sc- a bike to be able to kind of over, like, get over multiple different types of basic terrain and, and weather it, conditions. Well, it's, it's certainly weather conditions. It's, it's mainly pavement, but you can yeah. do some light off-road. Yeah, yeah. Right, and, and it, often it depends on the tire size you're putting on it as well. Yeah. Right, so you could use that as a commuter bike yeah. if you wanted to. Uh, something that's, I'd say, a little more heavy-duty if you scrolled back up into pavement. That, well, well, if you really have to go over to drop bar, drop, drop, a dirt drop bar, what does that mean, drop bar? What is that? Is that just a... Uh, the, you know, the, the handlebars? Oh, okay. Yeah. Most people think, you know, a traditional road bike with the yeah. drop bar. Yeah. Uh, that, that's our search. That's that's our adventure road bike. Well, these are pretty neat looking bikes. Yeah. Those look, and I like the, the images you got at the top there with somebody flying down a grassy... Well, there you go. That's, so yeah, we that's, call that's something more with my, along my style. That'd be pretty <laughs> neat. This. Now, who are your biggest competitors to, to Norco? Lots of competitors. I'd yeah. say the the three largest competitors would be what we refer to as the GS3, the GST. The GST. <laughs> Giant Specialized in Trek. Giant Specialized in Trek. Trek, yeah. So okay. they sell into the, the IVD network as, as well. What is that network? Uh, the Independent Bicycle Dealer oh, Network. Indi- uh, bicycle none of them are selling into the mass network yeah. uh, okay. or, or mass channel. So where is Giant based out of? Where did they come uh, from? Giant's uh, out of Asia. Asia, okay. Uh, Trek is in the out of the United States, yep. uh, Wisconsin, and specialized is uh, Morgan Hills out of California. Uh, okay, so you are really Canada's only or preeminent uh, bike company. Well, uh, I mean, I'll only, go but, wink, wink. Yes, but no. Yeah. I mean, the Rocky Mountain, Rocky, Lo- Rocky Mountain's oh. Canadian, oh, so okay. a local. Yeah. Da Vinci, Da Vinci, uh, okay. out of Quebec. Yeah. Uh, you know Brody, local guy, uh, Roger Yip. He ran Brody for many years. Uh, Kona is part Canadian, part U.S. Okay. Uh, uh, but yeah, certainly ag- again, because uh, we're all private companies. Yeah. Really, no one is is really telling you what they sell them that. So, are there any public 
companies that are in the Viking space? Yeah, well, Giant's public. Oh, is it? Yeah, okay. Marita's public, uh, Shimano's public, yeah. uh, the Excel group. Uh, Shimano the, does all gears and that type of thing. That is they? correct, yeah. yeah. The Japanese? Yeah. Okay. Uh, correct, yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. 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 Um, let's let's switch gears for a minute and go back because I could hear your enthusiasm yeah. in, in uh, Live to Play because I was originally having you come in just to talk about Norco because I didn't even know about Live to Play. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this is obviously a big part of your guys' business. Yeah. And you mentioned amongst them like Yakima, for example, yeah. and I have a Yakima a little trailer. Um, so how did you guys get this business up and running? Was this just a natural progression from originally just being a bike company to you got into this? And you're like, wow, you know, there's lots of other opportunities. How, how did this sort of evolve? Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I don't know exactly when it started, to be honest with you. Oh, okay. Uh, as, as far as I know, it, it, it started, uh, in the sixties or seventies and we've always been a distributor yeah. and, uh, and a bike brand. And a, okay. So you've, right. Yeah. And y you know, there is, there is a practical reason for it. when we were only in Canada, it's, it, it's a way to amortize your infrastructure costs, Yeah, sure. right? You're sending a sales rep out in, in, into a dealer network. Yeah. Now, why not give them a, a larger basket of goods to sell? Sure. Right. So you're, you're, you're amortizing kind of the cost of your sales team, all your credit team, your customer service team, your, all your warehousing costs, all that. You just yeah. get to amortize that over a large. And from the customer's perspective, if your customer being the uh, independent bike yep. dealers, they probably prefer that too, because then they've got the option to not only just offer, you know, your bikes, but also other products they might not have other been able to get. Yeah, absolutely right. correct. So yeah. we get a larger wallet share yeah. of, of their business. So we just become more important to them yeah. for the success of their business. Yeah. Yeah. Has, has Norco and, and live to play always been an independent bike dealer kind of a, like, is that always been your business model? That's our, it's always been our primary. Okay. Uh, but like even today, uh, when we look at third party brands, yeah. we look at what's the best channel for those brands to be in, because ultimately the consumer is going to decide, right? Right. If if one thing that's happened over the last twenty years, it really is a fragmentation that's occurred in in channels, right? You oh, know, you know. Well, you have direct to consumer brands, yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. Look at outdoor. Look at you know what MEC is doing these days in, in the cycling market. Yeah. Uh, you know the Forsani Group, they do a pretty good job. Uh, yeah. Again, you have the Canadian Tires, you have the Mass. Uh, you have consumer direct brands like a YT, a Comacell, a Canyon uh, down in the United States. Uh, so there's just a lot more competition and consumers are in charge today. Yeah. They have a lot more information available at their fingertips. And it's, as I referred to, you know, as I mentioned earlier, kind of that seamless integration uh, between the digital channel and the in-store channel. Yeah. And the consumers can tell you where they want to shop. Yeah. And so, you know, uh, now at the same time, we, we are fully committed to the independent bicycle dealer uh, because they do more than sell bikes. Oh, is they're they're, 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 they're yeah. the culture carriers of cycling yeah. and their local communion, uh, yeah. communities, right? They, they're in, they do advocacy, yeah. right? They do trail building, yeah. right? They will do group rides. Mm -hmm. They will train people how to ride, yeah. right? You know, it's, it's often a service center Absolutely. if you have a problem with your bike, right? Yeah. So we, we are fully committed to the independent bicycle dealer network. Yeah. We just recognize that you have to be present in other channels as well today right. uh, you know we have no intention uh right now norco bikes is only sold through independent bicycle network and on our you know through our website yep. that goes through they're fulfilled through an independent bicycle dealer so we we really want to support the the independent bicycle dealers but some other brands we carry are again yakima racks yeah. that would be in in rack specialty okay uh some some of the other cycling brands may be in in mec uh because mec may be the best channel yeah okay and that part of uh, Live to Play, you said the the uh, third party sort of distribution yep. is about sixty percent of your of that of that sales. No, no I said we have or, about sixty brands. Oh, 60 or sixty. Sixty brands. brands. Yeah. Uh, and you know, in in terms of sales, no, it's a significant portion yeah. of our sales in Canada. Yeah. Right. It's uh, it's it. No, it's a profitable business unit. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Right. Uh, again. You know, it might be profitable today and, you know, over the last 55 years, you really got to look to the future. Yeah. And uh, there is certainly a lot of concern, you know, what's Amazon going to do? Yeah. And how much are, are they going to cannibalize yeah. uh, sales uh, in, in, in other cycling channels? Yeah. Well, this is a great segue, actually. Let's talk about the future. So Amazon, great point. Um, you mentioned MEC earlier. I know that I remember when they announced they were going to get in the biking yep. market a couple of years ago. 
I don't even know how long ago it was. Maybe it's more than that. Probably about 10 years ago yeah, now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that was just bikes. I think they've always been selling the soft goods. Oh, gotcha. Right. Yeah. 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 Uh, where do you kind of see the future of the biking industry going? Do you have any kind of idea of where you see it? I mean, it's a crystal ball, but <laughs> it is a crystal ball there. Uh, when we roll, when we look out five years, you know, part mm-hmm. of our strategy is certainly we we see a, a in, in terms of categories, yeah. uh, e-bikes, particularly in North America. Yeah. Two years ago in North America, less than one percent of sales. Yeah. Today it's uh, it's fifteen percent of selling. Two years ago it was less, less than one one percent. Today, today it's 15 percent in two years in two years that's the growth in north america in europe crazy. uh there are some countries where it's it's over 40 percent of sales incredible right now are we going to mirror what goes on in europe yeah i don't know about that because in europe there's a lot more pavement bikes which yeah. is a, a, right. a big portion of, of the e-bikes and we don't have a high a, a ridership in the commuter uh, mobility type bikes in North America, although yeah. it is coming yeah. with with all the cycling infrastructure that's that's occurring over here. Yeah. Uh, so on the on the product side, yeah, it's it's e bikes, e bikes, e bikes. Uh, we think it's going to be. It's 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 kind of funny. When we did our business case to our shareholders a couple of years ago to start investing in e bike development, uh, we did you know your three year forecast. Well, we hit our numbers that we were supposed to hit in three years after one year <laughs> so, you know you, you'd figure we'd have our finger on the pulse and we yeah. we, we underestimated yeah. uh the size of the market uh, the movement is there yeah you know our, our company uh honey badger we just bought our first vehicle and we bought a um hyundai kona all okay electric. yeah uh he, kona i think is also brand new that right is right? correct yeah uh so we bought this this all electric and because the team was originally well, should we buy a hybrid and i'm like you know what i want to go all electric yeah and so glad we did you know what's something interesting is we got a rebate because uh, there was a federal yeah, rebate yeah. and this and a BC provincial, yeah. provincial rebate. And what I'm curious about is there's probably no rebate in bikes, right? Nope. E-bikes. But if you think about it, if the provincial government's willing to do rebates on on vehicles to get people to move away from combustion engines to um, to electric engines, you could make a th- I think a fairly strong argument the same way about having a rebate of getting people to buy e-bikes simply because the alternative is maybe that they're already riding a bike, but maybe they're not. Well, maybe you know. they're taking a bus. Maybe they're driving a car. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you think about it, if I'm driving a combustion engine vehicle and I don't really want to spend money to buy a brand new electric car, it's going to cost me a lot of money even after rebates. But I could go and put you know, maybe $3,000 into an e-bike, but I really need to spend five to get the kind of bike I'm looking for. You know, a two thousand dollar rebate, if it still accomplishes the goal of getting me to stop riding my combustion engine vehicle and start riding my bike to and from work, even if it's just in the summertime, I don't know, man. I've just maybe created a good well, argument. you know, well, maybe you want to lobby for us, provincial <laughs> government. What, what I will say, uh, there is no PST on bikes. Oh, there's no PST. So, so there's already no PST. Okay. But there's not a, an extra incentive to buy an e-bike, and yeah. and that's kind of when you you look at I'll say a lot of the problems facing the world today. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, we, let's say we talk about obesity, but let, let's just flip that around. How people are more concerned about their health, yeah. about wellness, about an active yeah. li- lifestyle. We're concerned about pollution, yeah. right? About urbanization. Yeah. Uh, you know, obviously about all our carbon footprints and the impact of fossil fuels. That's where the the bike, you know, it's not on its own. It's not going to solve all those problems. It could be a, part of the solution. Part of the solution. Right. And that's that's just a message we want to get across John, there, right? I, it's part of the solution. I am completely on board with you there. Yeah. And that's why, yeah, maybe I should lobby because yeah. I, I, I think I remember when Burrard Street Bridge brought in the temporary bike yeah. lane. And I remember what happened. I had a lot of, and I was, I was back back then when I didn't have children. I was doing a lot more biking than mm-hmm. I had, uh, unfortunately can't, can't do so much today. So I was used to riding that bridge with no bike lane. Yeah. And I, I've driven the, all bridges in Vancouver uh, with no bike lanes, and it, it got scary at times. And when it came in, I was, re- and I remember hearing all my friends, so many people I knew, were like, oh, this is ridiculous. Why? You know, and Gregor Robertson, of course, he was a big pioneer in this. And, you know, for whatever criticism you want to give Gregor, he did a hell of a job in building this thing out. And it was it wasn't well designed. And that initially there was a little bit, but people also just get used to it. And I, it, to me, it's like recycling and composting. You know, when that first came out 25, 30 years ago, you know, all everybody's like, oh, this is so ridiculous. It's way more work than just throwing everything in the trash. But now we're so accustomed to it. And it's used to it. 
and you almost feel guilty now. If I had a you know piece of paper, I wouldn't throw it. I get stink You're absolutely eye. right. Yeah. And so I I look at the whole industry. I'm hopeful for you guys, not just as a company, but for the industry that we do see more infrastructure of bike lanes because and going back to my idea of why isn't there a rebate for e-bikes? You know, because at the end of the day, if someone's riding an e-bike, yeah, maybe they came from that from a, a, a standard bike, but maybe they didn't. And even if you can get, you know, 50% more people getting out of their cars and getting onto e-bikes, you know, you've accomplished part of the goal of, you know, reducing the carbon footprint that yeah, we create no, every day. You, you are absolutely right. And, yeah. and that's our view of the world. I, I think, you know, with, with cycling infrastructure, again, you hit the nail on the head. Whenever there's change, yeah, like, like you know, the Broad Street Bridge is a perfect example. You know, someone who drives a car feels they've lost because there's one less lane. That's right. Right, which it's true. There's one it less lane. Or, yeah. you, or you go up, uh, what is it, Howe Street, and there's less parking on the street, right? Yeah. And so businesses are complaining, less parking, less, uh, you know, less l less commerce for their businesses. And and, and I think they actually did a, a, a study in Portland when they put in a cycling lane down the road. And, and at first, the local businesses complained about it. Yeah. But then they visited them, you know, a year or two later. And actually, many of them said it actually increased sure. the level of commerce. I, I don't know if that's the case in, in Van Vancouver. Uh, but... Whenever you have to make a change after the fact, there seems like there's some winners and some losers. Yeah. Uh, what we'd like to just see is when you're planning communities and you have that opportunity when you're building a, a new roadway. I mean, you, you wouldn't build a road today without having a sidewalk. <laughs> no. Right? Yeah. You, you'd be laughed at. Yeah. Right? So maybe a new road would in, in 20 years from now or, you know, all new roads, why not make sure there is a, a bike lane? I totally agree. Right. But it's hard retrofitting that in, you know, an yeah, old city like yeah. Vancouver, that's where you get a lot of pushback. But yeah. I, I mean, uh, you know, when you, when you look at it, driving across Burrard street bridge, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't drive it every day, but I, I can't say it's impacted my commute when I go over the bridge as much as I'll say the media led us to believe there's yeah. going to be gridlock in the city. Yeah. I have not seen that. It, it, you know, it's certainly an education. It's, it's more complicated driving now yeah. when you're coming out and, uh, you know, parking garages and from lanes and you, you know, the road goes one way and the cycling lanes going the other way. You got to yeah. just be more aware, but that, that's some growing pains. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, you live on the West side. It sounds yeah. like, yeah. Uh, have you, have you ridden, uh, driven along uh, point gray road? Uh, I have. Yeah. That is jam packed. Yeah. With Full cyclists. Of, yeah. And people, people on skateboards walking, and bikes, walking uh, and and remember the uproar yeah. when they closed it off. Now I don't live down there. Yeah. Right. But it's unbelievable. Yeah. I think there's more traffic on those roads now with with people to on bikes totally. and 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 scooters and skateboards yeah, and absolutely. walking. It's it's unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, that's that's. I think that's just part of yeah. building a, a vibrant city and a vibrant community. And yeah, there's going to be some losers along the way, and and yeah. hopefully the winners. Uh, there's more winners than there are losers. Yeah, well, it's just prop. It's just good progression, yeah. in my yeah. view. And sorry, the other thing yeah. I'll say on, on yeah. cycling infrastructure, when you look at the research, uh, one of the reasons people don't ride as much, uh, particularly youngsters, uh, is safety. You know, parents and roads are just more busy these days. Even they side are. streets, yeah. right? And so it's parents are parents are kids. concerned, right? We've been talking about trying to take from the west side yeah. where we're at, trying to take our daughters our kids with my daughter being old enough to ride herself now just to get down to Granville Island. Yeah. But we're like, we have to cross two big lanes. She's just not yeah. ready yet. And so, but if I knew there was a completely dedicated bike line, that'd make me feel a lot better. Well, you almost have that with the Arbutus corridor. Yes. Right. Again, you look at that, right. Yeah. Again, you talk about Gregor Robertson, a bit of a visionary there. Yeah. Right. Uh, you know, when he bought that back, was it from CN or CP? I yeah. forget which railroad yeah. company, right? But you look at how busy that corridor is today. There's runners, there's walkers, there's cyclists. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's brilliant. Yeah. It is brilliant. Yeah, it is. Now, you you guys are a, uh, we mentioned earlier, Coquitlam-based company. How many employees do you have? We have about 170. Okay. Uh, and then if you, if you include uh, some agents, yeah. some sales agents down the states, we have about 200 employees okay. uh, globally. Most of them are here in Canada? Uh, the m most would be here. So we have our Vancouver's our head office, really yeah. Port Coquitlam. Yeah. And then we have a facility in Toronto. Yeah. And these two facilities support all of North America in terms of warehousing, uh, in terms of customer service, uh, warranty support, credit, yeah. uh, you know, promotional activities, et cetera, et cetera. In the States, we have a, a rep team that we're building out. We have some demo event drivers down in the U.S. 
we have an Asian office for the supply chain side of yeah. the business, product development, uh, QA and QC. Yeah. And really just uh, a vendor compliance to make sure the, the product is coming out when it's supposed to come out. It's, it's, it's hitting our QC standards, and we do a lot of testing over there as well. Yeah. Uh, so th- those three offices, yeah, man, body scattered <laughs> around yeah. the world. And is there a seasonality to your, I mean, I'm assuming you're not selling the same number of bikes every month throughout the year. It's probably more prone to. You know, uh, from a consumer, uh, retail is certainly busier in the summer. Uh-huh. Right, spring and summer, it's the busiest yeah. season. As as a wholesale distributor, we are often selling bikes and filling the channel up off season. Right. And so again, in the northern hemisphere, right, we will start shipping out twenty twenty bikes. Um, now we've started shipping out some now, yeah. but all through the fall and through the winter, so our dealers can set them up and get them ready for when they really get busy in the spring and summer. But then we have a good jag of business in, in Australia, New Zealand, uh, Chile, uh, South, South Africa, yeah. and the Southern Hemisphere. And so that would be the opposite season. Yeah. Okay, well. Wow. Yeah. And with your uh, build bike or the... Ride or, your build, build your ride? Yeah. With that feature now available, I guess theoretically, you know, anybody in the world could just buy a Norco bike and get it shipped. Is that, is that well, a fair statement? Well, I, I will call it, that's only available in North America. Oh, that's only So available. we have not rolled that out uh, globally. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, this is, yeah, but this is for the more the custom one, but you also said you can now start just ordering uh Sort of well, and, bikes, okay, right? and in fairness, the D to C is also only available oh, still in North America. Gotcha. Now, now, outside of North America, we go through distributors or retail outlets. Okay, and so for example, our UK distributor, uh, they they would have a D to C program for the consumers riders in in the United Kingdom. Okay, likewise in Australia. So it's it's managed country by country, yeah. and we manage the brand entirely, the the selling channel uh, in North America. Okay. Um, you mentioned earlier that you your sales exceed about a hundred million a year now. That's phenomenal. Yeah. Um, what what would be the breakdown, um, if you don't mind me asking, of just like categories of like mountain bike versus what what, what I what I will share with you is the NPD numbers, NPD. Oh, which is uh, it's it's a it's it's a data research company out of the states. Okay, and so mountain biking is about thirty five percent of the market. Okay. Uh, road bikes are about 25%, and yeah. that includes those gravel categories and those those dirt cat- yeah. categories. Uh, e is around 15. Yeah, I think that. I think youth is around five. Uh, BMX, yeah, I said earlier four or five. I think it's closer to two or three when I yeah. think about it now. Uh, then you'd have some of your leisure bikes and some of your commuter bikes would would make up the the, the balance. Okay. And so, you know, we're more heavily on the MTB side yeah. uh, and, and e-bikes. You know, what, what I, I could share with you is, uh, so two years ago, yeah. our e-bike sales were virtually zero. Next year, there'll be over 25% of our Norco bike sales. Wow. Yeah, that's right. We and we just did the business case. <laughs> a couple years ago and, and I mean, that's gonna f- you've got to face certain amount of challenges with that kind of shift that quickly. No, yeah, I mean, well, like, certainly our product team. Uh, yeah. And again, you know, you kind of you mentioned, you know, when are you busy, right? E- each kind of functional area has their own cycle. Like yeah. like our product team, they're yeah. working on product now for 20, 2021, 2022, 2023. Right. Right. You know, the lineup for twenty twenty is all done. Right. Right. Yeah. So they're they're on to the yeah. <laughs> you know, they're 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 way into the future. Yeah. Right. Our let's say our warehouse team, well, they're more concerned with what's in the warehouse today, what's coming in and what they have to show yeah. over the next 30, 60 days. Yeah, uh you know, marketing, right? Yeah, you, you gotta get all your marketing uh programs uh planned, all the video. Yeah. You gotta you know, all your creative, you gotta prepare ahead of time so when you're launching the bike, you have all the support for it as well. Yeah. So every department kind of has their own cycle. Yeah. Right. And so. But, but, but going back to that comment about the, the fact that you went from two years ago, e-bikes were 1% per- yeah. percent and now it's 25%. No, less than one. Yeah, yeah. Less than one. Going into next um, year. And I think about the this, this Kona car that yeah. we just, the, the, the Hyundai car that we just purchased. And we I, apparently we got lucky because apparently the wait list is like a year long. Yeah. But someone went to order it and, they, and then I guess last minute backed out. And we got this. We picked this thing up really quickly. Um, and I started thinking, my, and, and, and to, you know, to the credit of my Honey Badger team, like they did, they called literally every dealership and not just for Hyundai, but for Kia, for Chevy with their uh, Bolt, Bolt. And it seemed like the common theme around all these dealerships was you got to wait a year. And it made me think, man, I mean, I, I'm sure it's very hard to do as a major global ma- uh, automobile manufacturer, but if you could pivot and start manufacturing, I mean, there's clearly a massive demand, way more demand than a supply of these e-cars and yep. electric cars, EVs. And I don't think it's just because of the rebates. 
in your guys' case, are you seeing the same thing? Absolutely. Absolutely. Like, are you basically short supply of these? Like yes. You, is it, you, can, you can't pump these out fast enough? No. Like that. So our site VLT. Yeah. That's one, some shootouts. It's one, of, you know, I'll pat our, our engineering and product managers on so, the back. So just to be clear, what are we looking at here? Uh, uh, the e, e, e Mountain. E Mountain. E okay. Yeah. If you look at that site. Yeah. It has won numerous awards. The, what, the particular bike? Yes. Which shootouts. Bike are we well, the, All of these. It's a site. It's the same frame, just different build kit. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. So uh, the VLT. It's okay. won numerous awards. Okay. What really moves the dial uh, for conversion yeah. is when your bikes get very strong reviews. Okay. And so we have... Uh, and again, where do these reviews come from? There's, uh, uh, well, indemnic, indemnic media. Okay. And so cycling magazines, again, uh, peers. Yeah. But uh, like we won the Lone Wolf shootout against 10 other e-mountain bikes. You know, so that would include those big three, you know. Yeah. Giant, specialized Trek, their bikes, as long as, you know, many and other so brands. What is the, what is the lo Lone Wolf shootout? What is that? I don't, you're talking it, in language. Well, it's, it's, a, it's an endemic cycling site yes. that reviews bikes. Okay, and they would have gotten a... They, would they, have they had all these... Well, they, <laughs> order, we will loan them out. Or and so can, magazines yeah. can do reviews or online right. sites can do reviews. This is like what you see on YouTube where somebody's like unpacked. Yeah, it, well, and, but, and you know, again, sometimes you have an individual who's an influencer. Yeah, okay. Right, and then sometimes a little more organized, a little more structure. Yeah. It's through the media. Right. Right. Okay. Uh, and again, when, when it won it, uh, we sold out. We sold wow. right through, and I, I again, I could be wrong. I think we've three xed, three or four xed our original forecast of that bike, and because all bikes are made in Asia, there's long lead times. That, okay. That's a challenge, yeah. and so it's sometimes hard to react yeah. if you have a really hot item yeah. to to backfill it. Yeah. And so your your first forecast, you have to nail that. And then the other thing with on the e-bike side is the pace of change of technology, how it's changing oh, so bet. quickly right now. Yeah. Is you, you you know you just you don't know what's coming out from yeah. other from from other companies, right? Well, I, I bought my wife the one of those Apple watches. There the, you go, the, yeah. The, the first generation, and I was so reluctant to do it. Yeah. But she was really wanting to have this watch, and uh, she's been complaining about it. It's only been three years. There you go. Oh it's yeah. It's like so yeah. And I imagine with these e-bikes, I mean, I can only imagine as we get into the future with uh, like LTE technology, G. Uh, 5G networks and stuff like that. I mean, these things will probably get to the point where you can dial them into your phones. and You, you can, can already do that now. That's oh, how you do oh. some servicing. Uh, <laughs> but 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 Crazy. where you're right, where we see a lot of advancement coming is, is in battery technology yeah, battery and the whole battery yeah. management. Yeah. Uh, because often uh, one of the major things people are concerned about is what's the range? How far can I go? Yeah. Right. And so often if you have a larger battery, people will think, well, I can go further. Yeah. Well, but you may have a less efficient motor. Right. Right. So it's it's kind of like, you know, you know, the car that has the biggest gas tank doesn't necessarily, yeah. <laughs> you, you can't drive the furthest on that. Yeah, yeah. It just it's may a, not be very, a, very fuel efficient. Tank. Well, a, yeah. a bike's similar story there, yeah. right? Is it's, it's, it's really what's the efficiency. Yeah. And then, then as a rider, uh, you have great control over uh, what power level you're riding at yeah. and just how much you're riding. So being that it's so hard, I mean, how do you then, like a simple question that I would ask you, and you're probably going to not be able to answer this, it'd be like, how much range do I get on a site VLT one, the top end of the range? How much range? But you you probably have to say, well, I can't really answer unless you tell me the amount that you're using of torque or whatever. You call, I mean, so yeah, how, are you going uphill all day? Yeah, you're right. going uphill. Is it cold? Is it generally warm? what I would say is you, you will get a full day of, of fun out of it. Okay. I, I I would think for the most people, yeah, they will wear out before the battery <laughs> dies up. <laughs> okay. Oh, really? I I think so you you point. you will it's get not... to you'll have an ear to your grin on your face and say that was a hell of a day. <laughs> I am done. Okay. So before the bike. I think this is really yeah. good, John, because yeah. this is the kind of thing that's probably obvious to you. I'm glad that I'm doing the interview, not some bike enthusiast, yeah. because it's not obvious to me. I kind of assume these things last for maybe an hour. No. Maybe thirty well, minutes. I mean, no, 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 yeah. no, no. So you like get you get I, longer again. I think you get more than thirty minutes. But if if you went up, I don't know, a thirty percent. Well, you can't even write up a thirty percent grade. But yeah. you know, you know, a ten percent grade. Uh, you, you know, for for an hour straight. Yeah. Uh, Maybe you. I, would, I'm, yeah. I'm again. I don't know. My engineers, our engineers, yeah. would probably you know disagree with me. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know how long you could do that for. Yeah. Right. But, but but the point is, you've answered my question by saying, I'm going to wear out before the bike is. I think you're going to wear out yeah. before the bike does. Uh, Are the batteries, yeah. that on that bike, it's it's actually inside, right? Yeah, that is so inside. So yeah. I can't swap the battery out, right? Not today. Okay. 
And how long would it take me? Do they just plug into a 120 yep. volt? And yep. how, how long from think, zero? How long does I it think take about the, four hours? That's it. Three or four hours. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's pretty cool. And so, yeah. So, you know, where we look at it is batteries are going to get smaller and lighter yeah. and more capacity. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and do they do these have screens on them of some type, or is there some kind well, of well, there's like a display, a gauge or a display. If you yeah. scroll through that, if it, it, it you will see the display. Yeah. And you have different power levels. Okay. So you have, I think, econ. Uh, and, then, uh, and it can give me any other data, like tell me how much distance I have or anything like that. Or well, you, you'll have like a fuel gauge, tell you how much oh. charge is left in it your battery. You okay. Uh, you know, most people, you know, a lot of questions you're asking yeah. is is. You know, very common questions. Once you get out and ride it, yeah, it becomes you, it'll become second nature. Yeah. You will know, yeah. right? Just intuitively. Yeah. Uh, okay, I can I can redo this lap and I should be fine. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, no. Another, another topic. I'm, we're, we're not going to spend. A, I'm yeah. not going to keep you here all day. But this has been a great, great <laughs> podcast, John. Uh, what about bike theft? Because if if unit yeah. prices are going up, I mean, when you and I were growing yeah. up, I think we were close to the same age. When we were growing up. I mean, an expensive bike was like three hundred bucks. Yeah. I mean, you know, granted, yeah. there's infl yeah. inflation. Up. Now you're talking yeah. ten thousand dollars. Is there what? Is there ways to have like some kind of like I don't know RFD tag or GPS unit inserted inside or some way to be able to know like where my bike's gone if it gets stolen? Like, what do you? What uh, there, do you there is, and and we need more advances in that type of technology, okay. right? Yeah. The 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 deterrent, and really, it's the deterrent you want, not necessarily the recovery. I mean, recovery. Yeah. Once yeah, it's gone. Once it's. Yeah. it's uh, and, and they're just rings of thieves that go yeah. around here. I think, you know, a few years ago, they, they caught a ring up in Worcester stealing a bunch of bikes. They, they found them in their van on their way down. And I think they were either down to the States or off to Calgary to swap them out really? with some bikes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, it's an unfortunate part of, you know, I just say life. Yeah. It, it's, 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 it's not, you know, it's not only in the cycling industry. Yeah. Uh, but, it's, but is there uh, any way with these e-bikes, because now there's power yeah. associated with it. I mean, I, I think about like, okay, vehicle theft, Pretty much, and mm -hmm. especially with new cars, doesn't happen anymore. It's impossible mm -hmm. to hotwire these things. You can't. It's not like an old Chevy. You're mm -hmm. just like, you know, off you go. Not that I know how to do that or anything, but, um, but with these bikes, is there any way to um, make it kind of impossible a person to actually ride it if they don't have a certain like a well, fob if, or if you like had that? a, I'm not aware of a mountain bike uh, or an e-bike that has a fob today. Okay. Some brands may have it. I'm not aware of that. Yeah. That that would be a good idea. Uh, what is possible is when you plug in your bike in for a diagnostic. Yes. Uh, it you know all the information on your bike, you, you know the serial number yeah. of of the of the unit. Uh, they'll know the history of it. Yeah. So if your bike was stolen. Yeah. Uh, you could contact you know I, let's say Norco. Yeah. And if that bike was plugged in to get a diagnosis, right you might be able to do some traceability there. Yeah. It's it's not perfect. Can you register your bike? Yeah, anything? you can certainly register your bike and we encourage people to register your and bike. Do you, do you register it with Norco? Or you, do you can register, register it with Norco, oh. right? And then you have a record of it. Right. And then, uh, you know, through through various forums, you know, Pink Bike is very good on this. If if, if bikes are stolen, yeah. it what, gets what out in the community. What is Pink Bike? What is that? Oh, it, it is probably, not probably, it is the largest uh, website for mountain bikers in the world really and it's a local company oh wow you cool. know yeah you want to i'd say a, a success story uh, you may want to bring someone in from there yeah to talk about pink bike they yeah they, they do a heck of a job wow cool yeah yeah well maybe maybe a fob idea there's a maybe yeah. an opportunity there like that i think about the um you, you said about registration that's also where i think blockchain. right here oh yeah bike, bike registration where i think blockchain technology is really cool there's a a company i met that uh is putting these um you as using like the rfd tags mm -hmm. but they're inside the cork of a bottle of wine and so they're a company that's and they're putting on the blockchain so that anybody that trend that wants to know the history of ownership because this is for people who want to maybe buy and sell high-end wine um you actually can track it all on the blockchain mm -hmm. and anyway it's a pretty interesting there, there's a, a a gentleman out of seattle and what's the name Maybe of this company? 509, 509 or 409 or something uh -huh. like that, where they are registering it and, and, and you, you get to tag your bike. Okay. And so that helps in recovery. Yeah. And so when the police then uh, recover a stolen bike, they're able to trace it back to the original owner. Okay. And so... Is, the, is bike theft becoming more of a problem? Oh, yeah. It is, hey? Yeah. Yep. What, I mean, beyond like sleeping next to your bike, 
um, what what are some of the things that people can do? Like no, what, secured storage and, uh -huh. and buy a very good lock and, yeah. and you know. What are the best, I mean, what are the best locks? Do you guys sell locks? Yeah, yeah we you, sell a complete are, range of locks. What, uh, are, what are the best locks in the market? Oh, you, you want something that's high security yeah. and that's rated and, and something that offers some sort of guarantee. Yeah. Any, any brands you want to promote there? They, well, we guys, have you guys, our, 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 you know, is, a couple of brands have, we sell is, bi is, is uh, Bike Guard Bike and Hip Lock. Those are two brands Bike we sell. Lock, uh, uh, Bike, Bike Guard and Hip Lock. And Hip Lock. Okay. Uh, and then, you know, some other known brands out there would be a Kryptonite and Apis yeah. Locks. Uh, there, there, there's some very good uh, yeah. security measures. But I think it's about being smart with where yeah, you're storing smart, your yeah. bike. Yeah. You know, leave it in your garage. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's funny. And I left... Uh, <laughs> I left one day for work. You should leave it in here. Or no, no. Well, no. I don't know. <laughs> Only if you lock you. This is where I was going to go with this. <laughs> I, uh, I, I, when I left, uh, I left the garage door open, and a bike oh got stolen out of our garage. Right now, luckily, yeah. it wasn't an overly expensive bike, but it, yeah. you know, it was it was a fairly new bike. Yeah. And and you know, and uh, <laughs> my wife says, you know, when you leave, you should close the garage. <laughs> oh yeah, thank you. I realized that. I just forgot. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and another story, you know, my son, he used to ride his bike uh, to school, yeah. uh, but he would often go down and ride it to the bus stop and then take the bus yeah. and then he'd lock it up at the bus stop. And one day his bike got stolen uh, and he had locked it up and he came home and he was quite upset. And he goes, yeah, my bike was stolen. He, he, you know, he, he thought he had done something wrong. I go, yeah, you didn't do anything wrong. If anything, blame me. He goes, why you? He goes, blame me for buying you a cheap lock. Because I just bought him a cheap cable lock, right? right? More of a, what I consider uh, an inconvenience lock, right? And how old was he in this house? Oh, I don't know, nine or ten. Oh, very, okay. yeah, for a guy. Experience. Yes, I know. You know. And he was, you know, he, nothing worse. Well, I had my you feel violated. Stolen. Yeah, it is. You yeah. feel violated. Yeah, it's a terrible yeah. experience. Right. You know, it's a sad introduction into adulthood when that yeah. happens. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, it's, it's bike theft. I mean, where, where bike theft really bites you, and just I think theft in general is, you know, people feel violated, and then they, they question should they go out and buy another bike? Right, exactly. It's yeah. just going to get stolen again. Right. Or they go out and buy, you know, a less expensive bike because they have the mentality it's yeah. just going to get stolen. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, that's, a, I'd say, a societal issue. Yeah. Not, not a cycling problem yeah, uh, when sure. it comes to theft. But do you, do you, do you, going back to that fob idea, do you think somewhere in the future we might be able to see a point where, like, I mean, again, one of the reasons that people don't steal cars is, A, it's hard to do so, and also just even, like, getting those cars to work without having to take them to a yeah. property. Oh, I, no, I, th I, 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 absolutely. You think we'll get there? Oh, I think we'll get yeah. there. Absolutely. I mean, you see that on motorbikes now too. Right. Right. You yeah, don't, you, you don't need a key anymore. anymore. No, no. Well, I mean, there's some that are key, but some but just a fall. Yeah. Right. Look at your Tesla. Yeah. Right. You just go in, <laughs> you just yeah. have it in your pocket and everything's yeah, fine. Yeah. You'd almost wonder, it'd be neat with these e-bikes. Yes. If it was set up so that basically if it wasn't powered on, the crank wouldn't turn. Yeah. And, yeah. and good luck trying to make lock it, it up. Work. Have it lock up. Have yeah. it lock up. Yeah. Yeah. Cool and then idea. when they have to, kind of like your phone, right? You have exactly. a code that you put in. And uh, if you get stolen, well, you can do, you know, find your phone. Yeah. Uh, or, you know, after, you know, three times or 10 times, yeah. they try, you know, eventually yeah, it shuts they, down. Yeah. Right? Actually, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm way too, th 2008 with a fob. You just have a biometric. You just go on <laughs> there and you go. a fob and then you know, fingerprint. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is really great. Well, John, this has been fantastic. Cool. I, I, I'm really glad we got to meet. I'm glad. Sam, thank you very much. I hope we listened to the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> They're great people to work they with, are. I'm sure. Yep. I know I've enjoyed working with their family over the years. And uh, I will be buying a Norco bike very soon because uh, my kids keep growing. <laughs> so they're not going to last on those cheap Canadian tire, no knock against Canadian tire, but nothing. They're they're gonna have to be into something nicer, and uh, I I can see where we're gonna go with this. This is great, and I didn't realize you had all the kids' bikes. So that's really neat. Thanks for your time today. You're welcome. Appreciate thank it. you. Yeah. Thanks, John thanks for inviting thank me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Take care.